Efendim iyi akşamlar Londra'dayız. Batas Türkiye Bölge Araştırma Merkezi'nin her yıl yapmış olduğu, düzenli olarak yapmış olduğu bir konferans var. Ve bu konferansın bu yılki konuğu da İzmir Milletvekili, CHP İzmir Milletvekili toparlıyorum. Selin Sayak Böke aramızdaydı. Bize bugünkü topla- bir de toplantı ben e, güzel tarafı benim için de e, yabancı misafirlerimiz vardı. Full İngilizceydi. E, ekonomi anlamında bir toplantı konferans e, gerçekleşti bugün. Çok içerikliydi. E, kısaca ne ne, neler vardı bugünkü toplantıda halk tibilicilerine biraz bahsedebilir miyiz? Hı. E, Türkiye müthiş potansiyeli olan bir ülke. Hem çok genç hem de coğrafi konumu itibarıyla e, ekonomik olarak kalkınmaya çok yatkın bir coğrafyası var Türkiye'nin. E, Türkiye'nin da, daha aydınlık günlerini mümkün kılacak bir reçeteyi e, alternatif bir ekonomik çerçeveyi konuştuk bugün. E, bu ekonomik çerçeve için bir hedef koyduk. Yani Türkiye'nin daha demokratik olduğu, daha özgür olduğu, demokrasinin ekonomisini güçlendirdiği, kurumlarının kapsayıcı hale geldiği, büyümesinin kalitesinin arttığı, borç yükünün azaldığı, yani Türkiye'nin refahının arttığı bir geleceğin nasıl inşa edileceğine dair bir yol haritası sohbeti yaptık. Ee, bunu tabii akademisyenlerin de olduğu bir yerde yapmak e, veriye dayandırmayı gerektiriyor, bilimsel gerçekleri ortaya koymayı gerektiriyor. E, bu, bu aydınlık geleceğin mümkün olduğunu ve Türkiye'de yepyeni bir siyasetle daha ilerici, herkesin fikrinin dinlendiği ve ortak bir üretimin yapılabildiği bir gerçek demokrasiyle ve başka bir ekonomik reform düzeniyle yani emeğe değer veren, insana bugünden yatırım yapan ve insandan korkan değil herkesi içine aldığında büyüyeceğini bilen bir Türkiye ile çok aydınlık bir yarın olacağına dair e, umut dolu bir sohbet yaptık. It's a, a great honor to be here. Uh, thank you so much. And the honor is that um, it's great to actually live up or be a part of a tradition uh, that uh, memorates uh, people who have added during their life to what they do and who have left a legacy. So it's an honor to speak uh, at this lecture, and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, thank you very much for the very honoring introduction as well. Um, so I. Clearly, there will be politics in my speech, um, but the politics will be identityless. The only identity uh, that's going to be in the speech is going to be the Turkish identity, uh, which is indeed uh, one that we care to build up further and to grow further. The reason I say so is, uh, so I have an academic background, uh, but one that actually cared for economics deeply because of what economics is, right? It touches upon everything in life. Um, and uh, indeed, economics without politics or politics without economics makes no sense. Uh, hence the title, actually, of this, uh, of this meeting. Um, it includes a lot of politics in it, but you're going to see me talk a lot of economics in the <laughs> uh, during the 40, 45 minutes that I have. Um, and what's more important is the talk will be actually one Uh, that probably has several emotions in it. Uh, but I think if you're going to leave this room with one message and one emotion, I hope it uh, to be a positive one that's built on hope. Uh, that's why, again, in the title, um, I put the phrase building up, because the future is what we should look into, rather than trying to make a sense of the past and trying to figure out who's to blame. I think we should take the current state of, of the situation as given and try to see what we can do to build up a better and a progressive future for Turkey. So whatever I speak of about the past will not to be uh, to, uh, as an exercise to figure out who to blame of why these things have happened. Rather, that it will be to put the picture in front of us, take a snapshot of where we stand in order to figure out the roadmap for future. Uh, this is why I hope the message and the sentiment you take out of this meeting is one that's positive because it looks to the future uh, rather than one that's negative uh, given the current state of affairs of what we're experiencing in Turkey, which has a huge global part in it as well. Um, you know, the sentiment is not limited to Turkey's geography these days, unfortunately. Um, so before I proceed, indeed, the title itself um, is an if and only if statement, if you wish. 
if we're going to build a, a progressive future for Turkey, which should be the clear objective we put on table, uh, this has to be one that relies on a democratic political structure being built in Turkey and one that relies on reforming the economic policy making, both its framework and the policies that come into that framework. Um, so these are not alternatives to each other. A progressive future requires that we build democracy and only democracy would not suffice to take Turkey to that progressive future. It has to be complemented with a strong economic reform, which actually is, if you ask, one where we democratize the economy as well in the process, instead of leaving it in the hands of uh, a couple of people, if you wish. Um, so the statement here is really an if and only a statement. Um, so what does it look like? Where, where should we put our eye on uh, for the future? What's the objective? Um, and here, you know, the future, the Turkey's progressive future, what I think it does look like is one that rises on several principles, right? A participatory democracy, one that includes everybody and not only at the ballot box, but creates active citizenship where people are actually part of a civil society that's very much integrated into uh, a true democracy and where people have a say in decision making, not only at the ballot box, but throughout any decision that's made um, within the system. Um, it's not only participatory, but the progressive future Turkey actually has a constitutional democracy. One where democratic rights, civil rights, fundamental human rights are actually protected through a constitution and where rule of law uh, actually prevails through that constitution that is not taken for granted but is indeed a true social contract that's drafted by the larger society. Uh, the progressive future is one that is an inclusive society. The heterogeneity of uh, different identities actually being in Turkey um, it should be viewed as one that creates a future that's progressive in itself because of that heterogeneity, rather than one that allows polarization and exclusivity. <coughs> so taking into account the heterogeneity of the society, but not exploiting that heterogeneity to grab power, but one that distributes the power equally across every group, um, and every class within the society where people feel included naturally as a right. Uh, the future progressive Turkey actually is one that's egalitarian. One that does not just include you based on equal opportunity, but also provides equal outcomes in the market where the equal opportunity actually results in equal outcome uh, given um, the effort that you put into it. Uh, and finally, it's one that actually uh, cares not just for growth in the immediate short run, but one that cares for sustainable development. And this, I think, is extremely critical because the sustainability aspect includes several sub-disciplines in it. Clearly, one of it is environment, right? It's a future that cares to leave the green to the future generations. Uh, but it's not limited with leaving the green to the future generations, but also leaving intact uh, a republic that relies on these principles and institutions that actually make these principles uh, an outcome in the country. So for a sustainable development, we should not just care of protecting the environment, but also for protecting the institutions that are going to guarantee that these uh, principles are actually outcomes that we experience in Turkey. So I'm going to go back to sustainability and what I think of this uh, in detail in the next uh, uh, half an hour or so. Now, the, if we set these principles, if we know what the progressive future Turkey looks like, uh, then clearly we have to think of what the instruments we're going to use to ensure these principles become the truth of life at the end of the day, because they're not going to happen in a God-given fashion. Right? We're going to have to put a framework, a policy set, and a politics that actually chooses and puts uh, an, a, a clear agenda regarding those uh, policies. So the policy framework and instruments that this progressive Turkey actually entails is a social investment state. Um, so this is redefining the welfare state, actually. 
Uh, and the redefinition of a welfare state in the progressive future Turkey is one that thinks of the state as a partner in investment in the, the people, in education, uh, in inclusive and active labor force policies, uh, one that cares about investment in infrastructure, not for the sake of rent seeking in the infrastructure activities, but one that actually builds up a social state where the inclusivity and egalitarianship actually happens through those social investments. So it's a social state, a welfare state, that does not just protect you um, by a birth given right, but one that also activates you um, as a participatory citizen, as an active citizen, but also one that can access resources and can indeed become an integral part of that economic and social structure. Uh, it's a social market economy. It's one where the market is actually valued for the competition and uh, the efficiency it might provide, but one that also knows that markets are not always efficient. That you need a state that regulates, that supervises, a state that invests in social activities and social spending, and a state that indeed might actually be not just an investor, but a participant in production in certain strategic sectors. So one where the state activities are not limited to political partisanship activities, but actually care for the larger society, and a state that is clearly on top of the market, right? one that doesn't let um, the vulnerabilities that are an outcome of the inefficiencies of, of, of markets at many stages and um, is remedies the inequalities that are outcomes of the market. So it's a proactive state, if you wish, um, in, in the market economy, uh, but allows the market to also create sufficient competition in areas where the market might be more efficient uh, than a state. Um, the, the policy framework has to rely and will rely on a separation of power where checks and balances actually limit the power of those who are reigning the country, who are governing. Where governance is not based on majoritarianism, but is one that's inclusive in the way it does stuff as well. So it's one where checks and balances are established through a, a strong judicial system, uh, through a true democracy that's going to be built on the principles I, I previously stated, and one where individuals are actually a part <coughs> of that checks and balances system, not just through their vote in the ballot box, but through their say and through their activism uh, of a natural democratic unit. Um, and finally, it's one that relies on inclusive institutions, um, and this um, is based on Daron Ajamolo and his colleagues' work, who have uh, convinced all of us, the world indeed, that development does not happen if institutions are not inclusive. If institutions are built to be exclusive, where institutions only protect the rights of a certain group within a society, <coughs> then you might have growth, but you don't have sustainable development. You need to protect every individual's right. <coughs> you need to ensure that the institutions include every individual in the society without disregarding even a single person within that society. So the future progressive Turkey, to make those principles a reality of, uh, of life, has to rely on inclusive institutions where property rights are protected, where human rights are protected, where every individual actually knows that they are valued by their right of birth to the Turkish Republic, not because the political powers care to do so. So this is the, the, the, the goal that, that's set. And this is what we have to build um, towards. Now having set that objective and having set the target, one has to then identify how far we are from that objective in order to draw up a clear and useful roadmap. So I'm very hopeful that we're going to build that progressive future in a very short period of time. But the next couple of slides and the next couple of minutes are going to be somewhat depressive. Because the current state of affairs, unfortunately, are not at the level we would care for to be tomorrow to arrive at, a, at that progressive <coughs> Turkey. Um, so what I'm going to do next 
is indeed take that snapshot, a diagnosis of where we stand, so that we can figure out what we have to remedy and what we have to change. Okay? Um, and clearly this will include politics in it, but again, this is not a blame game. Rather, it is one to figure out a, a, a roadmap that's going to matter for 80 million and indeed beyond the 80 million because we are an integral part of the, the global uh, world order and we care to remain a global partner in that world order. Um, so I'm going to go in the order of the principles that I actually stated. Um, so how do we build that constitutional democracy? Well, we have to figure out where we stand. And unfortunately, currently in Turkey, um, since the 20th of July 2015, we have been living under a state of emergency. So it's an extended state of emergency period where no longer do we have lawmaking, we have decrees. So we don't have the rule of law, but we have the rule of decrees, where decrees are not debated, they don't have a participatory process, and indeed, they go well beyond the jurisdictional limits that are drawn for them by the Constitution itself. So the Constitution in Turkey actually states, once a state of emergency is declared, this does give the right to the authorities to run certain issues by decrees. But those issues are those that are only related to the state of emergency. And the state of emergency was declared on account of this terrible coup attempt that we experienced in Turkey on July 15. So the Constitution clearly states that any state of emergency decree should be about that coup attempt that was averted through democratic forces actually in Turkey and should be to remedy, quickly remedy, this abnormality in the country so that we could normalize as fast as we can. But unfortunately, this extended state of emergency was actually uh, legalized through the Constitutional Court's decision where they said, we're not going to look into these state of emergency decrees that are brought through because we think whatever comes in it is okay. And let me tell you whatever came, com comes into it is not limited to the state of emergency. You have um, academics being expelled from universities on account of declarations they signed because they have the freedom and the rights to think and the freedom of ideas, opinion, and speech. This has nothing to do with the state of emergency or the averted coup attempt. You have imprisoned journalists on account of news pieces they have drafted. Has nothing to do with the state of emergency or the averted coup attempt. And it's not limited to such grave uh, events, but the state of emergency decrees also include mandatory changing <coughs> of winter tires. Now, this has nothing to do with the averted coup attempt. So clearly, and we now hear, right before we came here, we hear that there are two more uh, state uh, of emergency decrees that are in prep and are about to come um, into the public uh, domain uh, in, in a very short period of time, which again will include purges, uh, it will include closing up of civil society um, institutions. Um, so we are now in a routine of an extended state of emergency that is pretty much degrading or demolishing, if you wish, all rule of law in the country and deconstitutionalizing the Turkish legal and social structure. Therefore, if we're going to build a democracy that's based on a constitution, we're going to have to redraft a new social contract that will actually remedy much of these issues that are on table because of this extended state of emergency. Now, the legislative branch, as I said, has been weakened terribly um, against the executive powers. And we see it in this decision about the state of emergency decrease. Right? They think tires are about the state of emergency. And you can't go back and, and tell them this is not the case. Um, so there is effectively no limits on the executive power. And I checked out some international rankings and, and, and data. Uh, and Turkey, unfortunately, ranks among the worst six countries in the world uh, where the executive powers uh, are, have any checks and balances 
either through civil society, either, either through the judiciary system, or any democratic processes. And this is among more than 100 countries in the world. So clearly, what we're experiencing there is extremely suffocating as an individual who cares for the progressive future of the country. And as an individual who observes that all of those progressive forces are actually under attack. The attack is not limited with civil society. There are parliamentarians who have been jailed from two of the opposition parties. Um, and indeed, we also have a clear attack on those who have been elected through municipality elections. Right? So the constitutional democracy state in Turkey uh, clearly puts a picture that requires a lot of reforms in, in terms of the democratic politics. And I'm going to come back to what we can do here. And despite the fact of the graveness of the situation, indeed the solution can come very fast. All it necessitates it, is that we change that first item. Right? Let's first get rid of the state of emergency. That will be a huge breather and a step in the right direction and a huge step in the right direction for that progressive future uh, Turkey that we have. So it's not a difficult task. Um, yes, it's a grave situation, but indeed we know the roadmap that's going to take us to that constitutional democracy. Um, so Again, declining civil rights and individual rights that have been restrained. I gave you several examples. But if you look at Freedom House's indicators, uh, you observe this numerically as well. So the data speaks out for itself. Uh, over the past two years, we have a declining um, grading, if you wish, in uh, both political rights and, and, and civil rights in, in Turkey. In terms of uh, participatory democracy, we, have, uh, we are experiencing uh, an extreme form of majoritarianism. Um, the parliament has become one uh, of an approval, if you wish, domain, where you just raise your hand or don't raise your hand. And that raising is not an individual decision in the ruling party. It's one that's indeed dictated by the larger political structure. So it's not a process where each and every elected MP has their own voice and their own political power. It's one where the lawmaking structure has been minimalized into an individualistic perspective. And that individualistic perspective shows itself through this very majoritarian uh, way of doing business, rather than one of debate, rather than one of inclusiveness, rather than one of discussing and actively changing things. Uh, the parliament has been uh, diminished into a factory of laws, if you wish. Right? Things just have to pass through. Uh, the other day, we started discussing the most recent bill um, around midday, um, and the debates ended at 7 AM the next day. Um, one has to think what the rush was for. Uh, why would you keep the parliament open for more than 14, 15 hours, or beyond that, if you wish, um, to, to, to quickly pass laws? and at the same time pass state of emergency decrease uh, and not allow an active uh, discussion of a true political spectrum. Um, there is a big question mark among many in Turkey about the, f uh, the freeness, the fairness, uh, and the true representation of, of elections. Uh, past experience, unfortunately, creates the sentiment. Um, yet again, this also is something that can be cured very easily. Um, by, by change of um, power. Right? So um, an inclusive civil society in the process of the elections itself has proved to create a tremendous value in the past couple of elections in Turkey. We've had civil society actively participating in ballot box protection, which has increased the sentiments and the trust and confidence in the ballot box which is critical for confidence in the remaining parts of a true democracy. But unfortunately, the referendum that was overtaken, not at the ballot box, but through uh, the governing institutions, has created this negative sentiment. So all we have to do is ensure that the ballot box is left to the public, where the governing institutions do not become the deciding factor, rather the people's vote and the ballot box itself is able to speak for itself. Right? And these are not difficult to do. However, 
the situation itself is grave. Now, the data, unfortunately, speaks out in terms of where we stand. Uh, so uh, one might say, well, the, the world seems to be collapsing. Right? The, the global order has its issues as well. Many of these things that I speak of now uh, are things we hear from colleagues in different countries, uh, friends who are residing throughout the world in different continents. So the sentiment has, seems to have a lot of commonality in it. But unfortunately, it does look like things are a bit more difficult today in Turkey than in other parts of the world. Now, voice and accountability, whether or not you as an individual have a voice within the system, uh, we are worse than 144 countries around the globe. When it comes to rule of law, uh, we are worse than 108 countries throughout the world. And this is an economy that's by size among the top 20 in the world. Right? So when it comes to economic power as a world power, we actually have that in terms of our economic size. I'm going to come to that issue in a second. But when it comes to the basics that we care for in terms of the development and the progressive future, we seem to have a long way to go. Uh, government effectiveness. This is allowing institutions to operate through uh, a, a, an independent decision making, if you wish. One that's not purely in the powers of, uh, of the executive branch, uh, Turkey ranks worse than 95 <coughs> countries. Uh, this is from the World Bank's governance indicators. Um, and uh, the, the next slide actually includes data that's um, on a, a World Audit web, web page, which collects data from different indicators um, <coughs> that, uh, that exist. Uh, again, when it comes to democracy, uh, we are ranked as a hybrid democracy these days. Uh, and we have a, a, a decreasing uh, ranking, unfortunately, uh, in the hybrid democracy classification as well. And we are worse than 108 countries when it comes to democracy. Uh, press freedom. Uh, the number of journalists we have had to visit in prison, many of them old friends, um, has been increasing by the day. Um, and these people are, are not even allowed to see each other within prison. Um, so the state of emergency actually limits pretty much all life options uh, for many people. For example, for academics, uh, their passports have been confiscated. These are people who have the human capital to carry with them throughout the world geography, but are not allowed to leave the country and are not allowed to work anywhere within the country. Now this is to say, actually the state of emergency is telling them, we would like you to die because we're not going to give you uh, um, a life option uh, through uh, a job security or a job that actually allows you to, to have sufficient income for your basic necessities. Um, corruption is, is high. Um, okay. Inclusive uh, society, so th that's, uh, that's the state of uh, cons constitutional and participatory democracy. Uh, when it comes to inclusive society, uh, the, the dire picture continues there. Uh, we have um, a lot of gender inequality and violation of women's rights. Now, in a country where I just depicted a lot of human right violations, uh, this can be maybe thought of as a natural extension of that, right? Uh, women uh, rights being a part of that uh, <laughs> human rights. Uh, but there is an additional issue here um, where the political language that's being used trickles down to the society and has created increased physical violence against women in the country. Um, we rank 130th, 130, 130 among 144 countries in um, female uh, gender equality, if you wish. Now that's 130. When, it, uh, when it's political equality of genders, uh, we rank 118th. Uh, woman representation has been falling over the past two uh, ballot boxes. Uh, when you look at the ministerial positions, it speaks a lot about the political perspective. Women are usually appointed to the Ministry of Family and Social Policy. Um, so the duties that are viewed as, or, or the rights that are viewed for women, are predefined by the woman's role in family. So a social structure that does not come from the society but is imposed through politics is trickling down into this gender inequality. 
Now, the hope there is that, since it's not coming from the society's nature, but is one that's imposed through the political structure, a change in politics and policy would indeed quickly and very fast remedy the gender inequality experience in Turkey. Um, so, so there is hope there, uh, but we have a lot to do there as well. And I'm going to come back to this about the economy as well, because when it comes to economic gender equality, uh, that's where the worst performance is. Uh, indeed, uh, the female labor force participation in Turkey is very low in OECD standards. And I'm going to show you a graph that suggests even if the women decide to actively participate in the labor market, they uh, are faced with a huge unemployment that's much higher uh, than the rate uh, men face when they decide to become active in the labor market. Minority groups are heavily excluded from the bureaucracy. Um, this, um, again, uh, no blame game. If you look back to the, to the longer history of Turkey, uh, you'll probably see the same statement repeat itself uh, in different contexts. Uh, but today we are experiencing it in a very um, disruptive manner, if you wish, um, and therefore ne necessitates one where inclusivity starts from the government institution structures, uh, where the people who are actually a part of those government institutions uh, are an inclusive representation of the larger society. Currently that's not the case. We have a very polarizing political language in Turkey. Uh, again, this is not limited to Turkey, I know that. Um, however, uh, there is a statistic that I find, um, unfortunately, very um, um, bothering, but at the same time, very much telling the fact. Uh, this was a survey that was done a couple months ago, uh, maybe over a year, uh, that shows three quarters of the society do not want to be neighbors with, do not want to do business with, do not want to have their kids have a play date with families or people who have voted for different political parties. Now this is to suggest the heterogeneity through identity, which is a natural outcome by birth or by choice, is now added a new layer through political preferences. Right? Those identity differences, if you wish, are being utilized as an instrument through this political language to differentiate across uh, these identities and polarize the larger public with politics through their identities. Again, this is not maybe novel to Turkey, but the extent of how much it has infiltrated into the society has a novelty in it, unfortunately. Um, therefore, again, this comes back to when the curing, if, when I'm going to draw the roadmap to how we can cure this, Maybe the comforting part to this is that this polarization is coming through the political language. So if we're able to change that political language, we will be able to take a very huge step towards the right direction for that progressive future. And changing political language is probably the easiest among uh, many of the items I'm going to put on table. Um, so, so this has <coughs> resulted in pervasive partisanship, right? that political language that's polarizing. Uh, is also polarizing through the, the, the business doings as well. Um, the public procurement law in Turkey has changed once on average every month in the past 12 years. This is to say, one day they wake up in the state and say, today we're going to give the public uh, procurement to blondes. The next month they say it's going to be brunettes. The next month it's blue eyes. The next month, it's short woman. The next month, it's somebody else. So it's handpicking of who's going to get the public procurement through changing the public procurement law. Now this in itself has both that pervasive partisanship ingrained in it and also an abuse of rule of law to give full power to the executives. Once again, this is a way of doing business which can easily change by another principle set forth by a new political statement. Right? It's easy to change. You write a public procurement law and you don't change it. It's that easy. Um, sustainable development itself requires a, a definition that includes subtitles in it. Uh, the reason being, uh, today we are, I think this is a global phenomenon, we are obsessed with growth. Right? We, 
And this is partly because we have become a consumption uh, world uh, altogether, um, which requires that we keep up in, in the production that will allow us to consume as much as we can. But countries like Turkey that don't have oil, so we're not Venezuela, we're not Russia, we don't have the natural resources that's going to allow us to do rent extraction uh, without much production. To do all of these, we actually need to produce. So clearly, growth as an objective makes sense. But the quality of the growth will be as critical as that growth itself. Because at the end of the day, I did leave sustainable development to the end. Because for this to happen, you actually need all the other steps that I predefined. You need the constitutional democracy. You need the participatory democracy. You need an egalitarian politics and policies that's going to allow those principles. You need an inclusive institutional and societal structure. If you don't have those, the growth you have at the end of the day is not sustainable. And I'm going to show this by numbers in Turkey's experience and where we stand right now. Um, so it, basically, sustainable growth, um, by the name actually suggests, is one that cares about future generations as much as today, um, and therefore cares about the environment, cares about human capital, um, cares about institutions and protecting them, cares about rule of law, not just for themselves, but uh, to, to actually leave a legacy of those institutions to the future. So I'm going to talk about green growth. I'm going to talk about purple growth. This um, is a terminology used by colleagues um, who want to increase uh, gender equality uh, across countries in the economy. So uh, basically, I'm going to, I think the progressive future Turkey should have color in it. It shouldn't be dull. It shouldn't be gray. It should have the purple and the green in it, as well as many other mm -hmm. colors that will come out of that economic and societal structure. Um, a sustainable development has to be one that's financially sustainable as well. This comes back to the issue. Uh, a country like Turkey that doesn't have the natural resources will have to rely on its human resources to indeed keep that growth moving on. Therefore, we'll have to rely on an education structure that will allow these people to be an integral part of that production from the day they are uh, active in the labor market and in the future, but also a society that is not um, indeed oppressed through indebtedness. So the financial sustainability is critical because growing through debt has its limits. There are recent academic studies that show uh, countries that have credit to GDP ratios that exceed 80% are actually hurt by credit, which is debt at the end of the day. And the credit to GDP ratio in Turkey is right now 70% which suggests Turkey is very close to those limits of tipping point. Between 70 to 80, we have a gray zone, but credit doesn't help you to grow uh, sustainably. It gives you a breather in the short run. So I'm going to talk about indebtedness. Again, it has to be a growth that's inclusive in itself. So the institutions that I spoke of up until this point were those that would allow that inclusive growth. So I'm going to refer back to those points. And one that I care deeply for, as I'm sure you've understood so far, is we have to think of institutions as something we leave to future generations, not as instruments for our own power today. Right? So the sustainability of those institutions, both political, both societal and economic, are extremely critical for the sustainability of development. Now, where do we stand? Is, is growth in Turkey sustainable? Uh, has the potential for <coughs> growing? Um, now, there are several warnings I have to do here. Oh, five minutes. Mm. Cool. Yeah, but for five minutes, you, have, you shouldn't be talking about Turkey then. Um, now, growth. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the Mediterranean politician, and I'm going to add 10 to that. Um, <laughs> um, now, the growth numbers have been revised by the statistical office, uh, which is natural, right? The statistics can be revised by, by the changing structures in the economy. Uh, but unfortunately, we have not received, um, as academics, if you wish, or technicians who actually care for these numbers, we haven't yet received a, a, a clear depiction of why and what this revision includes in it. But the revision doubled growth rates. Right? So they didn't du just double the level and say, oh, we were mismeasuring something, so now we saw that it was there. Uh, therefore, we're starting from a different level. But it changed the level as well as the steepness of how fast that level was changing. Um, the gist of it was that apparently we were mismeasuring construction, 
Um, it's not surprising. Uh, you come to Turkey, it's a huge construction site. Um, so these growth rates are much higher than the growth rates you probably saw a year ago uh, for the same period. Uh, there was a revision, right? So I'm going to take these numbers as given. Right? These are the facts we're going to have to work with. Um, the 2017 number is a projection that's based on international uh, forecast, so we're not sure what's going to happen, but the growth rates that we've observed in the past couple of years are high. Uh, so historically throughout the Republic we have around 4 to 4.5 percent annual growth rates uh, on average. Uh, it has gone up to 5.5 percent in the past couple of years. But what's the quality of this? Right? Is this actually creating a welfare and an income to the larger society where people feel richer themselves? Uh, if you look at um, the past couple of years, and I took 2007 uh, for a reason, because up until 2007, you actually had a reform agenda in Turkey. We can dispute parts of it, you know, we can discuss whether or not it was the right policy agenda or not, but 2007 is when Turkey actually stopped having any reform agenda. Right? It became uh, a, a feeling the elephant economy, if you wish. We don't know what's going on. Whoever comes first gets the subsidy and we'll move on. Uh, so it was an extreme laissez-faire uh, system that was established in 2007. Uh, and you can see this in, in the numbers, right? We haven't been generating income. Uh, so while the economy seems to be growing at a fast pace that matches China and India, um, the, the, the income levels for people have not been increasing. And indeed, what's worrying in the growth numbers is, if you look at the composition, the red line is investment in machinery and equipment. So that's your future potential. Right? You're going to build those factories. People are going to be employed in them. They're going to have to use the machinery and equipment, especially uh, at a time when we're facing Industry 4.0 as a threat uh, of destructing, creative destruction processes actually speeding up. Um, but we're not investing in machinery and equipment. Over the past four quarters, it, machinery and equipment investment has been declining. It has been overtaken by construction investments. Right? So the quality of growth is actually not promising for that sustainable development. The state of labor, very high unemployment. Historically, it's high as well. It's at 10.9% right now. Uh, but not just historically, internationally, it's also very high. Uh, so even though we're growing, it's not just a jobless growth, but it's an unemployment creating growth. So it, it's, it, clearly there are problems in the structure of production and we, it requires a huge economic reform agenda. Uh, and um, the, the comparative countries are those that um, Turkey is usually compared economically to. These are the emerging markets. Uh, the youth unemployment is higher than unemployment just like everywhere else and, and Turkey unfortunately fares poorly there as well. Uh, no woman, you can fill the rest, right? It can be no cry if you wish, but um, it's not a young economy. Right? It leaves its young unemployed as well, but it also leaves uh, women unemployed as well. Uh, now, the increase in labor force participation rate um, is something that's positive when you take it uh, at face value. Uh, however, that increase happened through a law that is paying women for social care in their homes. So basically, it's limiting women's true participation to social and economic platforms. And unfortunately, in the most recent budget, there is another item that says uh, they're going to implement uh, some uh, projects that are going to allow uh, women to actually work wherever they want to uh, through digital technology. Uh, sounds very nice in terms of the flexibility it will allow but not in a country that has experienced an increase in labor force participation through social care services at home. Um, and, and it's very low internationally. Right? And among OECD, uh, we're, we're the, the, poor, the, the lowest uh, female labor force participation, but even if you extend the, the list beyond OECD, it's, it's still low in Turkey. Uh, the state of labor, uh, the, the, you have a very flexible labor market at the expense of, of lack of security, if you wish, uh, or not at the expense, but at the cost of lack of security. Uh, a third of labor is an informal work, um, so they don't have any job security. Uh, occupational safety and health hazards are very high in Turkey. Um, we rank 147th among 180 countries in terms of labor freedom. 
And indeed, the state of emergency that was declared, um, our president stated that the state of emergency was to intervene to businesses where there is a threat of strike. So clearly, the state of emergency is framed as being against labor. Right? So um, there is a clear uh, economic policy framework. The state of human capital dire situation. Uh, so as a, uh, as a mother of two, um, this uh, touches upon me not just as, uh, as, as a citizen, but as, as, as somebody who observes the potential of those two kids, uh, but sadly realizes that uh, equal opportunity is elusive in Turkey, um, and equal outcome in education is elusive in Turkey. And unfortunately, many kids are left out of that social mobility possibility through education. It itself is uh, disrupting equal opportunity. These are PISA scores. We rank 52nd among 70 countries in science, 50th among 70 in, uh, in reading in our own language, um, and 49th in math. And the success ratios or, or rankings don't differ across gender. This is to say it's a systematic issue. It's not just girls not going to school. It's literally about the education system itself. Um, as a former academic, and it's been worsening. This is the overtime graph. Uh, we're not getting better. <laughs> Um, now, this is from the Scientific American, which compares 40 countries in different dimensions about academia. Uh, as a former academic, this, uh, um, I can speak this uh, by experience as well, but so expenditure in R&D in Turkey has increased a lot. Among the 40, so that's the third column, we're 14th among the 40 countries. So we spend the money, right? And that's what we do. <laughs> that's where it stops. Uh, we have opened up a lot of universities. So we produce a lot of PhDs. Uh, these universities have become an instrument in uh, delaying unemployment rather than building up human capital skills. Um, and this applies, unfortunately, to the PhDs. And many of us who have gone through the process know how, how difficult the process itself is. And when it comes to the outcome, uh, the first um, column actually shows uh, the journals, wh which include um, Turkish <coughs> academics. Um, articles, if you wish. We rank uh, 36th, unfortunately. And in terms of, um, you know, the per country article, if you wish, uh, again, this is poor. When you look at the patents in the US, so international patents, when you look at patents within the country, the number has skyrocketed. But those that have gotten international patents, uh, we rank 34th. Now, this is to say, when it comes to inputs for R&D, we're doing something, but clearly the outcome is not there. So there must be something wrong in the process. Now let me tell you what's wrong in the process. Uh, so in Turkey, you, you have one academic journal per 1,290,000 people. We don't have journals. We don't have outlets ourselves. Um, in the H index, many of, this, of us know it, but this is a, a measure of indeed, um, if you wish, not quality, but how extensively your, your research reaches out to the academic circles. Uh, among those 11 uh, emerging markets that I listed, we rank eighth. Um, and I just showed the other statistics. Um, now, just to go back quickly, uh, there was a state of, uh, or there was a, a decree that was um, put forth in 2011 um, that um, demolished the independence of the Turkish Science Academy. So what <laughs> happened is many academics resigned and indeed established their own free uh, science Academy. And that academy has been producing Freedom of Academy reports, which are extremely valuable. I, I do suggest you read them. Uh, they're not pleasant readings, but they're well written. Um, and uh, the, the, the underlying reasons for this is there. Right? Rectors are appointed through state of emergency decrees by presidential ship, right? not through uh, elections. Um, or you have Tubitak, our science council, who has sent letters out to journals and editors saying uh, you will not publish or allow refereeship of those who have been purged through the state of emergency decrees. Right? So it's a heavily politicized academic environment which clearly, when it's heavily politicized, stops producing because people fear, sit down, close their door, don't talk to each other. They think clearly, they produce on their own, but it's difficult to publicize and get your message out. Uh, very quickly, the state of technology is in dire situation as well. I'm gonna go uh, very quickly through these. We have heavy inequalities in income and in, uh, and in wealth. 
Uh, and these inequalities have been increasing. Not surprising when you have a polarized uh, political system, that polarization gets reflected in the economy itself. Not novel to Turkey, but clearly. A heavily regressive tax system. Um, we're taxed through our consumption, not through our, our, our earnings. And the inflation tax is very high as well. Internationally, it's very high as well. Um, this is our current account. We're, we're heavily indebted to the international system itself. And um, uh, the indebtedness numbers, if you look just at that, 144 is the share of the total debt of the, the whole economic actors to their GDP. It has increased to 212%, which says the, the income that's generated in the economy, that's your payment potential, if you wish. You are borrowing more than double that. Um, and most of it is happening through the financial sector, which then redistributes it to the rest of the economy. Um, in short, we are at a juncture. So uh, we know where we're going to go. We know where we stand. There is a middle income trap, middle human capital trap, middle technology trap, a huge democracy gap. Um, and we know where we want to go. We actually have the recipe. The recipe is here. <laughs> I'm going to stop here. Uh, and sh because I'm sure the questions are going to have answers in that progressive roadmap. So I'll stand up if you allow me, take the question standing up so that I can uh, move to slides which have the answers in it. seven years myself, and being an assiduous reader of what is going on in Turkey, uh, including uh, blogs, I'm still bowled over by your uh, analysis of what is happening in Turkey. And I'm astonished at your candor in, the, uh, in your detailed explanations. <coughs> Can I say, as a former EU ambassador, who was very much involved in bringing Turkey into the EU customs union, that it's quite clear now that Turkey would not qualify to become a member of the European Union. It is an official candidate, but under the, cri the basic criteria, it would not qualify. Now, uh, I don't want to go and, and give you my views any further, but I think it would be very interesting to hear what Salem has to say to any of your questions. Who would like to be first, please? Uh, I would like you to mention uh, our hunger striking to academicians, which we've been um, you know, uh, talking about for a year now. And uh, in the street, uh, they have been you know, cast. Um, Erdogan's police uh, is very violent about it every day, even this today. And uh, I call people who don't talk about the hardest people of Turkey. <laughs> well, there are many who have the hearts, so. Oh, I know. That's the whole. I know. I'm just talking about the one that you, who doesn't uh, or talk about it. Mm -hmm. uh, could you please <coughs> talk about them a little bit? <laughs> um, so we have uh, two, um, one academic, one teacher. Um, who uh, was purged with a state of emergency <laughs> decree um, and who have been requesting their jobs back um, as a very basic right, right? The, the right to work, uh, the right of labor. Um, and unfortunately, they decided to take it to a hunger strike. Um, it has been over 250 days, I think. Eight, eight years now. Um, and one of them um, is now out of prison um, and one is still imprisoned. Uh, we have requested, uh, you know there is a state of emergency commission that was uh, established to go through these more than 100,000 purge cases to figure out which one was actually uh, um, related to, to the state of emergency, uh, the, the attempted coup, um, and which one was, was wrong. Uh, that's, uh, so we've been living under the state of emergency for a year and a half now, I can't, uh, I think more than a year and a half. 
uh, the Commission has not yet started going through the cases. Um, and the request that has been put forth for these two um, education lists, if you wish, has been that the State of Emergency Commission takes up their case uh, first um, and decides on whether or not uh, clearly that the, they should have been purged or not. Um, and unfortunately, the State of Emergency Commission has not yet started. So, so the, the political demand here is that the state of emergency actually commission starts working um, and um, that Turkey doesn't lose <coughs> people um, that's a, that are very valuable for the progressive future um, of Turkey. So that's the case. Anybody else? <coughs> yes. Sir, uh, thank you for explaining uh, the current situation uh, in Turkey. Uh, and uh, your ideals for Turkey's future. Uh, but what we uh, would like to know, uh, uh, can you speak up the uh, Turkish uh, people living and in Britain and looking at Turkey from uh, a distance? We see uh, that what you have described uh, in layman's term to us is uh, not a hybrid democracy or any form of democracy, but it is a dictatorship, it's a corrupt fascism. That's what we see uh, uh, looking uh, from where we are standing. How do you, and I, you have mentioned that the first thing is to set <coughs> up emergency state, but the emergency state, before the emergency state, Turkey was experiencing everything mm. you have described, mm. even before the emergency state. Mm -hmm. And we all know that the minute the current uh, ruling party loses power, they will be in front of the docks and they will be accounts, they will give an account of every corruption, every violation of the constitution that they have done, and they will pay for their crimes. <coughs> As opposition, uh, uh, party, mm -hmm. how do you see that a democratic, in a non-democratic situation, how will you gain power to mm -hmm. remedy democracy in Turkey, and uh, how will you ensure that uh, democratic elections can take place in, in Turkey? Good, the question I know the answer of. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy. Um, and it's, it's my slide, so I thank you for asking this question. Um, I'm going to show, so, so let me quickly pass through these slides because it includes the gist of the answer in it. I'm not going to go into the detail, I just want you to look at the last sentence that I put in every slide. Now clearly, uh, again, so uh, let me go back. Now monetary policy framework, right? I as a technician know what we should do for that progressive future, where inflation is going to drop if we do this, uh, where interest rates are going to drop actually because the risk premium of the country is going to be lowered. Turkish lira is not going to lose value by ticks every minute. Um, so we know what should be done technically, right? So for the progressive future, we need policy change. We know the recipe. For that policy change, we need a politics that actually knows and wants to implement those policies. Right? Uh, same for fiscal policy. I mean, today we don't have fiscal discipline anymore. Um, fiscal discipline itself is a, somewhat a technical issue, but it has a huge rule of law part to it, right, where the budget deficit comes in with the budget law, the government is allowed to borrow as much as that budget deficit in the law, now they are borrowing more than three quarters beyond that, which means we don't have fiscal discipline. So who would trust the 2018 budget? Excuse me. But your questioner is answering, how do you get out? Yeah, no, no, I'm going to come there. No, but the reason is, I know the recipe, right, for this. So we need new policies. New policies can only come through new politics. So the answer to almost all the issues comes back to changing the politics, right? Therefore, I have to define the roadmap of how we're going to democratically change that politics. So let me come to that. Um, and I value this. The reason I value this is the following. The issue is not that we don't know the recipe for that progressive future. Right? That part is the easy part. You know, we come to power, the next day we can change the economic reforms, we can change the legal structure. So how do we get this progressive force 
to power. Okay? Um, now, for that progressive force to come to power, actually, first I think we need the self-confidence that we can do it. Uh, and this is, I think, the, the one message that I care for deeply. And the self-confidence just doesn't come out just from the fact that you, know, you, you care to fight for it. It comes out by experience. And the experience is on the slide. Right? A bottom-up active citizenship, despite the amazing oppression. Right? You, you labeled several names for the system. I don't care what we call it. I care for what I live. Right? I care for what I live through. Um, and it's, it's not easy. But despite all the oppression, and despite the state uh, of affairs that's very difficult, unless each and every one of us in Turkey and those who care for that progressive future of Turkey um, come up and become active participants in the political process, not just through political parties, but indeed make alive the democracy that we care for. This has happened before. And indeed, in each and every case that it happened, in the past year or so, we had success. For example, Geraktepe. Geraktepe is a region in Artvin. So it's the uh, eastern um, Black Sea area in Turkey. Amazing geography. It's beautiful. I suggest you go and visit if you haven't seen it. Um, a mining company has been granted rights to mine in an area that's actually known to be environmentally and economically very valuable for the social structure as well. Right, so sustainability, we care for Jadatip then. The mining company that has gra been granted the right to do mining there is known to have close ties through these rent-seeking activities to the current executive powers. Right, so the same story we've seen everywhere. What happened is an old woman in Jadatip stood there next to a tree. She hugged the tree for days. And she was not left alone by the larger society. And we were able to delay the mining company's activities, a very powerful mining company's activities, for months and years through active participants of that true <coughs> democracy. Now, Jaratepe is not the only example. Child sexual assault bill. You might have heard of this. A couple of months ago, a midnight, a bill comes out from the, uh, the bag of uh, the, the Minister of Justice. Midnight, <coughs> right? It says those who have who are known to be predators, they have abused a child. If they marry that child, right, we're going to allow them to be free. Now, in five minutes, RMP stood up, given their duties to do so, and did not allow that bill to pass that midnight. It was a Thursday, which meant there were four more days still the next meeting of the parliament. It gave four days for the larger public to become an active participant in the fight against this ridiculous bill. So women in Turkey, across all walks of life, all political parties, all ideologies, all identities, they came out and said no to this ridiculous bill. And it was pulled back. Why? Because we actively participated in the process. We didn't just wait for the parliament to do something. We didn't just wait for our MPs to do their duties. We actually were an integral part of what they were doing. Doesn't stop here, the referendum. The end result that we are living now seems to suggest that the referendum has passed. I can clearly tell you it, it didn't actually. It was a no. Why and how? Despite all the oppression, the larger civil society took a duty beyond political parties and campaigned. Right? These people have been imprisoned, but they campaigned. And what happened is, now we are experiencing an illegal outcome. That's what we're going to change in 2019 referendum. But we actually had success there. So we have to remind the larger public as political parties that actually no one, the no camp did win. How? Through civil society participation. Doesn't stop here the justice march. After this illegal a result that happened in, in the April referendum. Our party took it to the streets. We walked from Ankara to Istanbul, 453 kilometers. Now, that justice march was a huge success, not because we walked, but because each step that we took grew 
and made the noise larger than that step. Initially, it was only us. And then people were actually yelling out from their windows. They were chanting support. And the support was not political partisanship. The support was the call for justice. Now, this is critical because this shows the roadmap, actually, what we have to do. Right? And I understand the feeling of hopelessness and despair. But unless we figure out that if we're not a part of it, that hopelessness is going to be continually imposed on us, hope can only happen if we stand up and become an active part of the process. Now, so what do we do? And I told this in, in the speech where I said, we're going to have to redraft a new social contract. And I didn't say we're going to redraft a constitution, because unfortunately in Turkey, there is a continual debate of the constitution. We never think of what that constitution actually stands for. It's a social contract. It's a contract that entails the principles that we're going to live together around. And I think we've taken amazing steps in the right direction here. One, the referendum. Turkey actually said, we want to live with parliamentarian democracy. <coughs> At the no camp won, and the no camp said, we want a parliamentarian democracy. So what do we do? We hold on to this, and we make 2019 not an election year, but a referendum year, where the referendum is about reverting Turkey back to the parliamentarian democracy, with knowing its deficiencies, knowing that we're going to have to cure many <coughs> of the deficiencies that pre-existed. The Thank second, you, uh, one last sentence. The second one was the March for Justice um, uh, showed us justice as a principle. Now we have to discuss what next, right? What next? What, what, what other principles are we going to live around? Right? I have a list, but I think instead of politicians imposing the list, the social contract should come, just like it did for parliamentarian democracy, for justice, through the society. It's a very simple question. How are you going to turn the millions that marched on the Justice March and whatever the percentage that voted no, whether it was 51 or 52 percent that was robbed, to more than the 26 percent that the JHP has traditionally got in the last two or three elections? Because only by doing that will you gain enough seats in Parliament to make your change. Um, so we. Um, that's the second step of where change is going to happen through, right? Let's keep in mind, uh, we just went through a referendum where we voted uh, for or against um, a one-man uh, show versus a, a true parliamentarian democracy. So 2019 is not an election of who's going to govern. It's an election of a referendum, indeed, of whether or not Turkey is going to revert back to parliamentarian democracy or it's going to ingrain into this one-man show that's being we're observing to be very costly. Um, I say this because it's not about CHP becoming uh, the main party in power in the parliament. First, we're going to have to form coalitions around these principles. Now, I value this because the minute we think of 2019 as an election, then you start thinking of candidates. 2019 is not an election. It's about the principles we're going to redraft that social contract on. When it's about principles, it's easier to bring people together. Right? The millions that convened in uh, the meeting after the Justice March, there were at least three and a half million people there. Right? They were not just CHP voters, which suggests when it's a principle, people are happy to come around that principle because they realize there are different political views can only live if and only if you have that true democracy that will allow that coexistence of different views. So this comes back to the issue. I do care as a CHP MP and someone who strongly believes that CHP is the only political party who can bring this progressive future to Turkey, that we have to grow. So that's on my duty list. However, the first task I have to allow for CHP to become the governing party to ensure that we actually have that democracy where it will matter to be in the parliament. <coughs> so I should first create an organization as a political party and as a citizen, I think, in this case, where people realize that if we have to figure out which pillars we come around together with, which we have to lead as a political party. So our duty is not, as of yet, and we should continuously work on that, but uh, to, to think of how we're going to go beyond the 26% votes but it has to be about which principles
people are ready to come around together and redraft that social contract. Yes, this gentleman over here, that's the last question. <laughs> I hear what, you, what, what you're saying about how you want to play 2019, but it's a, isn't the reality that in order to change the system and do what you want to do, you have to gain power, and that means gaining the presidency. Oh and yeah, we want to win that, I mean, exactly. that's not to say. But, but the, the, the president of 2014 was lack of preparation, not having, not having a candidate until the last minute, even though you knew for uh, seven years that there's going to be an, an election. Um, I don't see that you're ready for the presidential election, which is now pretty close. So how are you actually going to do it? Um, so um, I'm going to disagree. Um, and the disagreement is the following one, I'm, I'm, just like I didn't in the, in the presentation, I'm not going to do blame games for former mistakes that the party might have done, right? That I, I'll do within the party, you know, I, I, I, I'm not a silent person when it comes to <laughs> um, discussing for change. Um, so do not fear that. However, uh, for 2019, we are working. Right? The Justice March itself was a march towards that 2019 objective. Again, the candidate should be an outcome of those principles that we agree on. Right? And today, I have no doubt there are several <coughs> candidates that are probably in this political spectrum already out there. Uh, but Turkey, the minute we start discussing candidates, it's going to be a different game. Right? So. Yes, we should be prepping for a candidate, but the candidate should not be chosen for the sake of the candidate, but should be chosen for the representation of those principles. So if we get the larger society to continuously talk of those principles, we mobilize the larger public to actually come around those principles, and this is where our duty lies in, not ensuring that we get 50% of the vote as a single political party, that, but lead the political parties and politics in Turkey towards those principles. And I think here it would be unfair to say CHP is not doing uh, her own duties. Uh, both the parliamentary and democracy fight in the referendum and the justice march, the two principles we have agreed on, have been led by, uh, by our party's uh, political efforts, if you wish. So uh, I'll disagree um, there. Now I must uh, <coughs> ask you all, I'm sorry, ma'am, really are way over our, our, our timetable, which is outside my control. Uh, I, I want to thank you personally, but I, I, I now also want to call on our chairman, who, who is really responsible for arranging all of this, uh, Cecilia Carsley, to propose a vote of, of, if I may say so, heartfelt thanks to you for what you've done, what you've said to us tonight for coming. Absolutely. I mean, that, that's not difficult at all. I mean, we listen to a very inspiring vision, an idealistic vision of what Turkey might be. And, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, and, an understanding of all the facts about what constitutes Turkish society and, and politics today. And the vision that you presented was so much in line with universal democratic values, universal ideas of, of human rights. I mean, I'm sure that there wouldn't be anybody here who wouldn't hope that Turkey will one day, well, that all the countries in the world, but on this occasion, particularly in Turkey, will, will become like that. And, and I'm sure we wish you and Everybody in Turkey will success in this We're going to do it. <laughs>